His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, is the spiritual and temporal leader of Tibet's people and exiled government. In 1959, he dramatically escaped into exile and established the Tibetan government in northern India. The Dalai Lama has dedicated his life to the promotion of world peace. To this end, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. Religious harmony and the preservation of Tibetan culture are also two of his main concerns. Throughout the last 50 years, he has traveled around the world, sharing his wisdom and Buddhist teachings. Thank you. <laughs> there are few souls in history which have had such a positive influence on our world. No person alive today can rival his simple and profound message of love and compassion. His Holiness the Dalai Lama currently resides in the foothills of the Himalayas in northern India. Here, the Dalai Lama is visiting the Gyoto Monastery, which is a sanctuary of Tibetan culture and Buddhist teachings. The life of a Gyoto monk is a life of practicing loving kindness and compassion for the benefit of all. The monks do this by the practice of the tantric arts, including harmonic chanting. The Dalai Lama is highly grateful to the Indian government for granting his people refugee status. Now, last nearly 50 years, the field where government of India can do, they extend maximum help. The Dalai Lama's journey into exile is a triumph of the human spirit over occupation and persecutions. The lineage of the Dalai Lama spans back over 300 years. After the death of the 13th Dalai Lama, Tukten Gyatso, in 1933, the Regent Lama, seen here, and the High Lamas found a boy, Lamo Dundu, they believed to be his reincarnation. Amongst many serious spiritual tests, the boy was presented with a number of identical ritual implements only some of which belonged to the previous Dalai Lama. The boy recognized these implements, passed all the examinations, and was declared the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso. In 1940, he was taken to the Patala Palace, where he was officially installed as the spiritual leader of Tibet. At age six, His Holiness began his monastic education and training. By 1950, Tibet was under the heavy influence of the Chinese military. At the age of 16, His Holiness was called upon to become the head of state of the Tibetan people. On the 10th of March, 1959, General Chiang Chu Wu, the Chinese military commander in Lhasa, extended a seemingly innocent invitation to the Tibetan leader to attend a theatrical show by a Chinese dance troupe. When the invitation was repeated with new conditions, that no Tibetan soldiers or bodyguards were allowed to accompany His Holiness, an acute anxiety befell the Lhasa populace. Tens of thousands of Tibetans gathered around the home of the Dalai Lama at Norbuglinka Palace, determined not to let His Holiness attend the show alone. Disguised as a common Tibetan soldier, the Dalai Lama along with a small escort, passed through the crowd and headed south to the Indian border. Within hours, the Chinese army had invaded the palace with tremendous force. Shapa Chose Lobsang Tenzin Ronpoche, the former abbot of the Gyoto Monastery, recounts the horrific events that unfolded on that horrendous day. <laughs> Thank you.
the Chinese use disproportionate amounts of violence to put down the demonstrations. With no mercy shown, the scale of destruction and use of force was unbelievable and unnecessary in that it was like the sky had fallen down to earth. Such was the cruelty of occupation and invasion that it was absolutely untenable to continue living in Lhasa. We just had to think about running away to a safety without knowing where to go. Maybe it was a quirk of some divine force guiding us, somehow that we headed for southern Tibet, which proved to be a safe route to go into exile in India and seek refuge. One of the reasons for deciding to head for southern Tibet was that the territory was under the control of the Tibetan resistance group by the name of Chushi Gangru, four rivers and six peaks, formed in 1958 by Kampha fighters to resist the Chinese. And so they kept the paths Chinese free. The territory the Kampha's controlled in the southern Tibet linked almost to the Indian border, which then allowed importantly His Holiness the Dalai Lama, subsequently myself, and about 100,000 refugees to pass safely into exile into India. Three weeks after leaving Lhasa, the Dalai Lama and his entourage reached the Indian border. From there, they were escorted by Indian guards to Bomdila. His Holiness met with the Indian Prime Minister Pandit Nehru, who had already agreed to provide asylum for the Tibetan refugees. Most of the Tibetan refugees were moved to road camps in the hills of northern India. In 1960, His Holiness the Dalai Lama took residence in Dharam Salah. In 2005, the Dalai Lama opened the new Gyoto Monastery in Dharam Salah. Only about 60 Gyoto monks escaped to India to be with the Dalai Lama. Today's monastic community in Dharamsala has grown to a population of over 500 monks. Thanks to the continued support of the Indian government and generous donations from Tibetan foundations around the world, the Gyoto Monastery has managed to nurture and preserve the ancient rituals and traditions of Tibet's rich history. Since being forced into exile, the Dalai Lama has been actively engaging with the global community, sharing his wisdom of Buddhist practices and seeking support for Tibet's plight. In 2008, he took to the stage of the Royal Albert Hall in London. Not sort of going to meditate oh, in silence. <laughs> Don't worry that. <laughs> Now, nearly half century, and remain as a homeless, and a generation change, but still, our people keep Tibetan spirit from older generation to younger generation. So that's our original aim. As soon as we become refugee. I think a culture of peace, culture of compassion. Now, because of this light, this is necessary. <laughs> this is not red headset, or yellow headset, <laughs> or blue headset. Oh, nothing, this is something practical. <laughs> My day starts 3.30 every morning. So then at least four hours some meditation. One, one portion of my meditation is visualize those individuals who take ruthless sort of decision. So visualize these things and then take their anger, uh, hatred, suspicion, and give them compassion, spirit of forgiveness, patience, like that. 
looks silly. <laughs> Just imagination. No actual effect. But the practitioner's emotional level, immense benefit. Yeah, I guess, yeah, no. But the person who carried these wrong dream, that actually really deserve our compassion, our sense of concern, because they are wrong doing. So from the Buddhist viewpoint, they have to face consequences. So there's more reason to feel concern about the, the troublemaker rather than victims. The Dalai Lama's first commitment within his teachings is the promotion of human values. These human values include compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, contentment, and self-discipline. All human beings are the same. We all want happiness and do not want suffering. Even people who do not believe in religion recognize the importance of these human values in making their lives happier. His Holiness refers to these human values as secular ethics. He remains committed to talking about the importance of these human values and shares them with everyone he meets. What is human value? Money? Oh yes, very important. Sometimes I jokingly see telling uh, the Buddhist audience particularly the Tibetan. We usually you see, recite uh, one Tibetan special sort of mantra, that is Om Mani Pemi Hum. So we recite, uh, sometimes we a uh, little bit of hurry. Then you see we recite Om Mani Pemi Hum, Om Mani Pemi Hum. Then Om Mani, Om Mani, Om Mani, Om Mani, Om Mani. <laughs> so that sounds, looks like money, 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 money like that. Uh, so maybe dollar money, dollar money, or pound money, pound money like that. <laughs> uh, so, but they, of course, what I think value, and of course all these external, what is it, the facilities, there's valuable things, good. But all these uh, provide physical comfort not a mental comfort. If you have plenty of money, then some kind of satisfaction in their mental level, oh, I have a lot of money. That is illusion, actually, because we notice among the billionaire, plenty of money. But as a person, very unhappy person, a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety, a lot of suspicion, a lot of jealousy as a person. Billion money fail to bring inner peace. Billion money bring more suspicion, more uncomfortable, more worry. Anyone who truly believe if you have money, everything can solve. Everything because of that, then you get real 100% satisfaction. That's I think illusion. Money can bring some friend, but that essentially friend of money, not friend of being yourself. Your fortune go like that. You become richer, richer, richer. You found more friends. When, when your, what is it, your fortune goes like that, then these friends also, I think, disappear. Even you want to telephone, they may not answer, <laughs> isn't it? So these friends are not genuine your friend, but a friend of your money, <laughs> isn't it? So therefore, the real, real friend only come out of the sense of concern or respect. Respect them, develop genuine sense of concern or compassion, and main point is 
that is a seed of happiness, seed of inner calmness, inner strength, more inner strength, self-confidence, self-confidence, less fear. That automatically develop some kind of close feeling towards the rest of the human being. Compassionate attitude open our inner door. As a result, much easier to communicate with others. If too much self-centered attitude, then fear, <laughs> doubt, suspicion, these come. As a result, our inner door closed. Then very difficult to communicate with others. The way to promote human value, which is the basis of our inner peace, that is a very important factor for happy life, including healthy body. The Dalai Lama's second commitment is the promotion of religious harmony and understanding amongst the world's major religious traditions. Despite philosophical differences, all major world religions have the same potential to create good human beings. It is therefore important for all religious traditions to respect one another and recognize the value of each other's respective traditions. As far as one truth, one religion is concerned, this is relevant on an individual level. However, for the community at large, several truths and several religions are necessary. Promotion of religious harmony, uh, if you have sense of global responsibility, uh, every human being, including non-believer, even those people who criticize religion, who anti religion, they also human brothers and sisters. So once we develop that, then of course those people who have different religious faith, no problem. It is their right. So actually all religious tradition, all major religious tradition, you see, carry message of love and sense of brotherhood, sisterhood. So different approach. Some say there's God. God created all these things. So true sense, brother, sisters. And some say law of causality. Again, good experience come from love, respect, other. Bad result come through harming other. You get negative consequences. So same, same aim, same meaning, different approach. Therefore, there is no obstacle to bring genuine harmony among the different institutions. Now here may be useful, make this distinction, faith and respect. Faith was one's own religion, respect to all religions. The Dalai Lama's third commitment is to the Tibetan issue. His Holiness has a responsibility to act as the free spokesperson of the Tibetans in their struggle for justice. As far as his third commitment is concerned, it will cease to exist if a mutually beneficial solution is reached between the Tibetans and Chinese. The third commitment is regarding Tibetan problem, Tibetan struggle. The most important Tibetan people, inside as well as outside, they very much trust me, put a lot of hope on me, so I have the moral responsibility to serve them as much as I can. Of course, my ability, my knowledge, my experience in various fields, very limited. But whatever way, that is my moral responsibility to, to serve them. But there will be time limit. I already something like semi-retired position. Because since 2001, we already have elected political leadership. So my position something like senior advisor. Most cases, uh, political leadership listen my view 
but sometimes it doesn't. It's good. And also it's in my part, some of his policy, I have some reservation, but I always remain quiet. So we are sincerely practicing democracy. A priority for the Dalai Lama is the continuation of the lineage of knowledge for the Tibetan people. The Gyoto Monastery in Dharamsala has kept the traditions alive, along with Tibetan centers and support groups around the world. Now new generations, I think second generation, and in some cases third generations, now already there. So not only in India, but even in Canada, in America, in Switzerland, now these second generation, third generations, now they very, very in the spirit of being Tibetan, with Tibetan culture. I think past 50 years experience, quite encouraging. And meantime, we also, you see, establish our school. Boys often as young as six years of age join the monastery. I was 13 years old when I came to monastery and I feel very good to come in monastery and I came with my own self in monastery. I told my mother I want to go to, mon to become a Lama for that I came here. I was very exciting to see Dalai Lama and I got to see Dalai Lama from near and I was very happy. And you know, Dalai Lama is very big Lama. And why he is Lama? And he is like a God. Whenever he dies, and he will, he is coming again to earth. And he is not, he is making the peace higher and higher. And he is very good for peace. And there, and he is our Lama, very big Lama. Then they re-established a monastic institution. And also, you see, we uh, established in Nanare the quality of Buddhist study, same standard of those monasteries sort of, through centuries enjoy. So this is something new. Now we, India, now I think more than 40 years, you see, we established serious study in the nunnery. So now already highest Kishik degree already in the, in the nunnery. With help of Indian government, I think uh, among the refugee, uh, political refugee, I think we Tibetan become most successful refugee community. So it is very uh, very good. You see, they're so far. You see, these really doing very well. The Dalai Lama's role as the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people has been pivotal over the past 50 years. But his role as leader of the Tibetan government in exile has been more challenging. The Dalai Lama has been generating constructive dialogue for the Tibetan quest since he petitioned the United Nations General Assembly in 1959. He won the support of countries such as Malaysia and Ireland, which insisted the UN must act on the Tibetan problem. Be it in Tibet or anywhere else in any part of the world, must be a matter to be taken up by the United Nations. Can it seriously be claimed that a country like Tibet which has become almost legendary by reason of its separateness from the rest of the world and which has all the marks of a distinct national personality belongs essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of another country. The General Assembly agreed to adopt three resolutions. These resolutions included that China would respect the human rights of Tibetans and their desire for self-determination. 
the United Nations resolutions were not implemented by China. Unlike his predecessors, His Holiness has held talks with many prime ministers, royal monarchs and presidents in a bid to gain support for Tibet. His life in exile has led him to more than 62 countries covering six continents. In 1996, he traveled to South Africa where he met with President Nelson Mandela. Uh, I pray and I wish you see, all your hard work you see, can succeed and not only benefit for people in this country, but also I think for humanity, I think you, uh, you can be a very good example. It has not been an easy journey. The Chinese government has a lot of influence on the global political arena and regularly pressures world leaders not to meet with the Dalai Lama. Sorry, you said this is not a political visit, um, but had Gordon Brown invited you to Downing Street, would you have accepted the invitation? No reason to refuse. <laughs> <laughs> the Dalai Lama also enjoyed numerous meetings with President George Bush. Between George Bush and me, we have, you see, one common thing, that is the promotion of democracy. More recently, he has presented his case to governments around the world, including the UK Foreign Affairs Select Committee. I think the world knows we are not seeking independence. So sometimes uh, I jokingly see telling people, uh, we both sides have some mantra or recitation. Uh, I, I recite one recitation, that is, we are not seeking independence, we are not seeking independence. That is my recitation. Uh, perhaps it's a thousand times, I think, I, I, I think it's a thousand times. Hmm? Then the Chinese sort of uh, recitation is, Tibet is part of China, Tibet is part of China, Tibet is part of China. That is their recitation. <laughs> so, just a mere recitation, not much effective. So, we have to work. I, I feel a little sort of because of that, uncomfortable. But I am Buddhist monk. All my sort of contact, what I really feel, I express. Uh, I have no sort of interest or practice saying something and keep in mind something different. After all, solution must find between Chinese and Tibetan, no one else. So the support from Chinese people is very essential. Now already some writers, some uh, intellectuals uh, wrote, I think, really very uh, objective sort of what's it is. Uh, assessment or articles. So this is really hopeful sign. Universal responsibility. Each of us must learn to work not just for oneself, one's own family, or one's nation, but for the benefit of all humankind. Universal responsibility is the foundation for world peace. It seems to me many problems which we are facing Essentially, man-made problem. Of course, nature disaster. And these things, something different. But major portion of our problem is essentially our own creation. And meantime, nobody want a problem. I think every everyone in early morning when we get up. I think nobody hoping, now this day, I should have more problem, more trouble. Nobody feel that. From early morning, as soon as we wake up, I think, hope, wish, some pleasant day. That's the human nature. And most of these troublemakers, essentially, not necessarily intended. But you see, their way of approach has become unrealistic. That causing problem, unexpected. And unrealistic approach happened, that also not intentionally, but because of lack of perspective, comprehensive perspective, and in many cases, short-sighted. 
So that ultimately lack of sense of global responsibility. We divide we and they and feel uh, our interest is something independent from their interest. So taking most important our own interest and disregard others' interest. So that creates problem. In reality, our interest, others' interest is actually, I think, very much interconnected. So in the reality, we are part of the six billion human beings. Therefore, six billion human beings happy, one individual bound to be happy. If six billion get trouble, you cannot escape. So that's the reality. So according to that reality, our century-old concept, we and the day, something independent, I think that outdated. So therefore, the idea, the sense of global responsibility, develop sense of concern, of entire humanity, entire world. Throughout his spiritual and political career, the Dalai Lama has received numerous awards and honours, including the Congressional Medal. Perhaps his most notable award is the Nobel Peace Prize. The committee recognised his efforts for the liberation of Tibet and his quest for a peaceful solution rather than using violence. So think more about others' well-being. You get maximum benefit. So, thank you. Throughout his travels, His Holiness has spoken to many public audiences and touched the hearts of millions around the world. You know, he just celebrated his 70th birthday, so he won't be around forever. So, you know, these are these are tremendous opportunities to, to be in the really the midst of greatness. He's the embodiment of all the Buddhist compassion. So uh, when he comes, you experience that. And um, it's very important because, um, you know, then one feels inspired to share that same thing. In 2009, His Holiness visited the remote Indian town of Tawan in the eastern Himalayas region bordering China. The close proximity of this visit to Tibet concerned the Chinese government greatly. The local populace practice Tibetan Buddhism and speak a tongue similar to Tibetan. We were very skeptical whether his visit would be possible or not. Because the decisions are taken at the higher authority, uh, at the central level, uh, the government of India takes the decision. Otherwise, we were longing to have him here at any cost. So we all public of Tawang are very, very happy at his court and we feel that God has arrived at our place and we are very, very, very happy. Foreigners regularly travel to Dharam Sala in India to hear the Dalai Lama's teachings. I feel um, some joy sparing all, all away. People are very happy to see their, their Dalai Lama. Well, we are coming from Korea for almost 300 people come to take His Holiness teaching. So traditionally, two weeks after the Losar date, His Holiness will give a teaching on the past lives of the Buddha. He's been doing this for many years, even this in Tibet formerly. It's little wonder that in these times of global conflict, that people of all cultures and religions 
desire to hear the wisdom of His Holiness. Our century, uh, whether we like it or not, become like a century of bloodshed, a century of war, a century of violence. Now those problems which our generation started, now let's solve these, our younger generation. <laughs> so hopefully, now our younger generation, which belongs to this century, to the first century, I think they, in order to have a peaceful century, the peace does not mean no longer any conflict among humanity. Conflict bound to happen. So they, they, in order to keep peace, in spite of this conflict, the only re realistic method is spirit of dialogue. Respect others' right, understand their viewpoint, then in the sense of brotherhood, sisterhood, and try to solve in the spirit of reconciliation and compromise. So, uh, I often use it telling, uh, share with people, now let us try to create this century should be century of dialogue. Then, I think the real possibility of peace I think some inner peace, some uh, certain kind of inner peace through you see, practice. So here now, this is one example. In order to keep inner peace, compassion really makes differences. Very important. Because a uh, self-centered sort of person, very sort of cherishing oneself, only oneself. So, the reflection of that feeling, the use the word I, 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 like that. So that word, nothing wrong. But the real attitude here, just think of oneself. So, think only oneself, then even tiny problem appears unbearable. If your attitude, think others' well-being, that means others is infinite. So think more about others' well-being, your mind open, widened. Then your own problem appears not significant, insignificant. Same problem, same tragedy can be much different how you see it. This angle, you can see something very bad. From this angle, oh, okay. That often, you see, uh, happen. Therefore, the compassionate attitude really widened. So one's own problem, then uh, not much sort of seriousness. So that, I think, makes differences, our inner peace. The way to promote uh, human value, which is basis of our inner peace, that is very important factor for happy life, including healthy body. Some scientist actually, you see, told me anger, hatred, fear actually eating our immune system. Compassion increasing or strengthening our immune system. So therefore, health viewpoint and peace of mind in both cases, warm-heartedness is key factor. Like no other religious leader, the Dalai Lama is constantly in the media spotlight. Although English is not his first language, his joyful persona and sincere honesty has helped win the international press's support for the Tibetan movement. Telling the truth, 
I always describe like BBC or CNN, I do not consider as a pro-Tibetan, pro-justice. I consider these, uh, these also, I think the BBC correspondent here, I always describe BBC something very objective. Particularly, I developed this, convi this conviction during Falkland War, yes. right. Folk Island. Falkland, yeah. Uh, the British government then, Mr. Mrs. Tiger, is a little <laughs> bit disappointed. You see, your sort of clear presentation. So something danger about B British sort of our Navy, isn't it? Yes. So at that time, I developed sort of conviction. Ah, BBC, that's really objectively, you see, present. So therefore, you see, the BBC, uh, I do not consider uh, something like pro-Tibetan or anti-Chinese. Genuinely pro-justice. And they are report very objective. So this is the Chinese media very much lacking. Uh, Jonathan Mirsky. Oh, yeah. yeah. My respect. <laughs> My this is not a good friend. way for me to make friends with other journalists. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? <laughs> the person uh, who asked me 80, because as early as 87, if things become more violence than what I do. Then I, uh, I immediately answered, if violence become out of control, then my option is resign. You see, this answer recently also I repeated. So thank you. Yes, now your questions. <laughs> now I've forgotten what I was going to oh, ask. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and ben Cole at Positive TV. Could you please positive TV. Positive TV. Well, what's yes. the meaning? It's again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's instead of negative TV. Uh, <laughs> then all of them. That just means that we're, we're beginning to sit. The MPs are going into the chamber. Mm, I see. <laughs> not it's not, not a fire. Oh, <laughs> not not the sign of and our meeting. No, no, no. no, no. Then okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, all fire. No, no fire, no fire. fire. <laughs> we, we, cannot, we cannot jump here. <laughs> okay, uh, so. Yeah. Clearly, a press conference with His Holiness can be a humorous experience. But when the subject of China is raised, it is no laughing matter. I'm Li Peng from China News Service. Uh, you just mentioned uh, human rights. Do you think the uh, situation in, uh, of human rights in Tibet is better or worse at the moment uh, than previous period before 1959? It's a tragic story. Worse. 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 Then you get answer. If I say worse, then immediately you say, oh, there are no exaggeration. There are some journalists who are in Beijing all ready to cover, to cover the Olympic Games. Oh. And some have come back and said the Chinese authorities are showing them lots of information about Tibet and taking them to Tibet heritage centers oh. and giving them the Chinese government's view. So oh. they're being very organized to, to use the opportunity. This is the claim oh. of having journalists in, in Beijing to show them the Chinese authorities' oh. view. Uh, that's not unusual. <laughs> now, last 50, 60 years, always go like that way. Even during Cultural Revolution, the all Chinese media full praise about Cultural Revolution. <laughs> so then later, you see, political situation change, leadership change, then full criticism about Cultural Revolution. <laughs> like <that. laughs> The Dalai Lama shared some of his insights regarding the struggles of dealing with the Chinese government at the Royal Albert Hall. One Tibetan monk, I know very well before 1959. Uh, he spent 18 years in Chinese Gulag. So this monk then used to join the Dhamsala. Uh, one day we casual talk. And then he told me during 18 years in Chinese Gulag, he faced few occasions, some danger. Then I thought, danger on his life, maybe. And I asked, what kind of danger? And his answer is, danger of 
losing compassion towards Chinese. So that kind of sort of attitude. Uh, but recently, the Chinese government seems to pay more attention about the dependent problem. So, uh, and also I think because of the worldwide sort of clear signal about your concern, I think that this is definitely impacts in the leaders of Chinese government. So, please continue your sort of expression of solidarity, expression of your concern, really helpful. And then, wherever you see you find the sort of opportunity, talk with Chinese brothers and sisters, and then talk, educate. Because this is some of the Chinese, they have no full in, fuller information about the reality. So sometimes you see, they really got the feeling we Tibetan are anti-Chinese. This is absolutely not. Before the Dalai Lama dies, by tradition, he will inform the monks of his new reincarnation, and they will seek the child Lama. But Tibetans fear China will dictate who is the successor to His Holiness as a way of extending their control over Tibet. This was demonstrated by China's removal of the Tibetan Panchen Lama and installing their own. The Kamapa is touted by many as a possibility to fill the vacuum left by the 14th Dalai Lama. At the age of 14, Kamapa made a daring escape from a Tibetan monastery. He crossed the Himalayas by foot and horseback to India and now resides at the Gyoto Monastery in Dharamsala. <laughs> I definitely feel I can be the bridge between the two, the old Tibetans and the youth of today. The Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people are considering many options to continue the lineage of the Dalai Lama. One option is appointing the 15th Dalai Lama before the 14th passes away. This is a radical departure from the traditional formality. The Dalai Lama's life has been a remarkable journey. Now aged in his 70s, he remains optimistic about his people's future. Now hopefully, the Chinese leadership should use more common sense rather than emotion. Then I think the future is bright. Of course, this moment we are passing through a difficult period, but this is impermanent. His Holiness concludes each day with prayers before retiring. He often cites a favorite verse found in the writings of the renowned 18th century Buddhist scholar saint Shantidewa. For as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, until then, may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world.